Hello, and welcome to the State Secrets Podcast brought to you by the Cypher Brief. State Secrets sits down with the most influential and experienced voices from the national security world. I'm Suzanne Kelly. And I'm Brad Christian. We're so glad to have you with us today as we talk with Cypher Brief expert, Admiral Jim Stavridis, about his new book, 2034, a novel of the next world war. We'll also be posting this podcast to the Cypher Brief's YouTube channel for those of you who are a little bit more visually inclined. Admiral Stavridis, welcome to the State Secrets Podcast. It's great to be with you. I'm ready to go. <laughs> you co-wrote this geopolitical thriller about a naval clash between the US and China in the year 2034. First of all, you have so much experience with your military background on the real issues regarding China. Why did you choose a novel for your vehicle for telling the story? Yeah, I'll give you three quick reasons. One is um, I could have written a, a policy book about the dangers of a war with China, but I think uh, it's kind of boring sometimes. Uh, no offense to my friends who are all writing policy books, and I've written nine books of nonfiction. But I think people resonate to stories. So point one is um, because it's a more interesting format, I think. Number two, uh, when you're writing fiction, uh, you can, if you will, kind of splash the paint around a little bit. Um, you know, when you're writing nonfiction, you're in a straitjacket in that it's got to be 100% accurate. It's got to be footnoted. You know, your references have to be correct. Um, there's a lot of freedom in just uh, opening up in the world of fiction. And third and most importantly, what you can't put in a policy paper are characters. You can't use the kind of personalities that uh, we, were, we brought to the page here uh, to help tell the story of the nations as they interact. Simply can't do that in policy paper. And, and I'd invite you, you know, just think about your very favorite book. Um, I think most people would come up with a novel that has some indelible character in it. For me, it's The Old Man in the Sea. And, you know, I, I couldn't tell you exactly every single movement of that short novel, that novella, but I can sure tell you about Santiago the fisherman, about his resilience, his bravery, his mentorship of the next generation of fishermen. Characters carry stories and stories move minds. So that's why we decided to go with fiction. One of my favorite books as well. Former Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis and former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates have both called this book a cautionary tale for our times, which is saying something. The book starts on March 12, 2034 with your character, U.S. Navy Commander Sarah Hunt, on the bridge of her missile destroyer conducting a freedom of navigation patrol in the South China Sea and a Marine aviator, Wedge Mitchell, flying over the Strait of Hormuz. Now, here's a line from the inside book jacket. By the end of that day, Wedge will be an Iranian prisoner and Sarah Hunt's destroyer will lie at the bottom of the sea, sunk by the Chinese Navy. You write about something that you've written about in the cipher brief um, many times before, which is kind of the coordination of US adversaries. And then you throw in some cyber warfare to boot. So all of that said, how much of this is entertainment and how much of this do you lie in bed at night worrying might really happen? Um this is very much uh, designed for people to worry. Um, it is in every sense a cautionary tale. And I kind of held my breath when I sent the manuscript to Secretary Gates and uh, Secretary Mattis, because I, you know, I don't know how they would react to it. Um, and both of them came back recognizing that this isn't about entertainment, although I think it, it is a page turner and people uh, many, many people who've read it love the, the flow, the kind of plotting of the novel. But um, this is meant for people to read it, to put it down, to look out the window and say, oh my God, we could sleepwalk into a war with China. That's what keeps me awake at night. And by the way, uh, I have real skin in the game in the sense that my son-in-law is Chinese American. And we're, by the way, just taping this after these terrible shootings in Atlanta, um, which appear to me anyway to be hate crimes inspired against the Asian American community. The point is, there is a great deal that can go wrong as tensions rise between the US and China. And the message of the book is A, 
worry about it. It is real. And I assure you, the technology in it is potentially possible in the 10 to 15 year future. Mm -hmm. And B, the message to take away is this is not where we want to end up in a war with China. So collectively, we ought to be thinking, how do we reverse engineer this thing? Come back in time to the present. What do we need to do to avoid it? short of simply capitulating to all of China's desires, which would not be my advice either. And I'm hoping that um, a lot of the policymakers on the Hill um, are reading this book too, and then taking a look out the window, as you mentioned, and, and giving some deep thought to some of these scenarios. As we know, there's you know, a diplomatic tour from the US um, working on the China issue um, very intently right now, so. Yeah, and we might wanna point out that um, as we, again, are taping this, um, our Secretary of Defense is in Tokyo, Seoul, and where's he going next? He's going to India. India plays a pivotal role in this novel. Where's our Secretary of State? He's in Tokyo and Seoul alongside the Secretary of Defense. Then he breaks off and is going to Alaska for counterpart meetings with the Chinese. So the world of 2034 in so many ways is already here. It's unfolding in front of us. And I think for the Biden team, what they have to do is confront China where we must. We're, we can't simply see the entire South China Sea as territorial waters. This is a vast body of water, the size of the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico combined. We can't just say, ah, it's okay, China. We don't wanna to go to war with you. So yeah, you now own the South China Sea. Doing that effectively blows up the law of the sea treaty. Pretty soon every country will be claiming its own historical territorial seas from the Gulf of Sidra by Libya to the South China Sea by China. And who knows what Venezuela, for example, might claim of the Caribbean. We can't acquiesce in that world. So we've got to confront China on crucial issues like that. But I would argue, and I think the Biden team gets this, we've got to find zones of cooperation so we can avoid stumbling into uh, not only a cold war, but God forbid, a hot war. And I think there's a question you were gonna ask regarding kind of the differences between the Trump and Biden administrations. Yeah, I mean- I'll be glad to address that. You don't even have to ask a question. <laughs> or, yeah. uh, the Trump administration, let's give them credit for recognizing the problem. Um, they were catching, if you will, the rising assertiveness of China and um, they brought to the table a collective wary sense of where China was going. That's good. What they then did poorly, in my view, they didn't have a plan. They didn't have a strategic approach. One minute it was President Xi is now the BFF, best friend forever of Donald Trump having a big chummy dinners down at Mar-a-Lago. And three months later, the attack team on the tariffs and trade issues is uh, banging heads with China. And the military is kind of being used for freedom of navigation, but isn't really uh, sending the right signals about our network of allies, partners, and friends. We're not, uh, we're trying to charge South Korea more money to defend them. How do you think that's received in China? Point being, Trump administration, I give them credit for seeing the challenge, but I take away a lot of points for lack of a strategic approach. So that's where I think the Biden team uh, is coming in and they are a group that are deeply experienced. I know every one of these people in the national security team because they were all in similar positions one level down uh, five years ago when I was uh, Dean at the Fletcher School and I knew them all before that when I was Supreme Allied Commander in NATO. They're all part of the Obama team, obviously. And everybody has moved up a level. Mm -hmm. So including Vice President Biden is now, of course, President Biden. Uh, former Deputy Secretary of State Blinken is now Secretary of State Blinken. General Austin is now Secretary Austin. So what you've got is a team of people who A, are very experienced, B, are very collegial. I can tell you that this, I, I'm not one to use sports analogies often, but if this was a basketball team, um, these are players who are more interested in assists than they are being the MVP and scoring all the points. 
They want to make each other look good on the court. It's a terrific sense of teamwork in this group. And third, um, they get Asia. Don't forget, this is the team that came up with the idea of the pivot to Asia, which frankly, the Obama team was never uh, ultimately under Obama. They were never able to bring that to fruition. So I think you're gonna see a very coherent plan that blends all elements of national strategy, policy, national power together. And I think the underlying piece of it is gonna be confront where we must, cooperate where we can. So stay tuned, we'll know so much more in six months. That's how I would assess it. One of the things, Admiral, that China is really playing up is their strategic long-term view, and they downplay America's ability to really have a consistent strategic long-term view. I think at, at the end of the book, one part of it talks about you know China's prediction that in a thousand years, America will barely even be a memory on the history of, of the planet. How do you think about that? You know, you have mentioned the team that that the Biden uh, team is much more consistent. We've seen a consistent approach already in the messaging that they're giving. We've seen China react fairly aggressively already this week, accusing the U.S. and Japan of an encirclement approach. Do you think that we're we are now going to be able to craft a long term strategy that pushes back on China's narrative that we can't be strategic and we can't have a long term view? Especially when you have an election every, you know, every four, four or years. eight years. Yeah. Sure. I think the, the short answer is we can craft a strategy. We can execute it. But you correctly point out, Suzanne, the, the weakness in the machine is that you could have an election in uh, the next national election, 2024, and it could be reversed. Um, that's the messiness of democracy. Um, but as far as... Um, can we craft a strategy, hue to it, and accomplish real results? Uh, how about the containment strategy dealing with the Soviet Union? Mm. Gosh, how did that turn out? Hmm, last time I checked, it's the Soviet Union that's going to be a flicker in the memory of human history, having lasted less than 90 years. I'd bet on America. And I will also say, uh, at the end of the day, this is this great question in international relations democracy or authoritarianism. And it's fashionable these days to say that democracy is on the wane and the authoritarians are winning. I don't think so. Um, let's look at it this way. A hundred years ago, there were perhaps 15 democracies in the world. Today, depending on how you score the term, somewhere between 100 and 130 democracies. Authoritarian countries, a um, hundred years ago, there were two massive authoritarian countries. One was called Russia and one was called China. Guess what? They're still authoritarian countries. Um, they'll be the last ones to flip, if you will, to democracy. But I'm really with Churchill on this one. Democracy, worst form of government, except for all the others. <laughs> because human nature doesn't want a centrally planned life at the yeah. end of the day. People yeah. want a voice. And again, I'm going to bet on this fragile, young idea called democracy. Democracy in the modern context, you know, only dates back a couple of hundred years. It might be 250 years old, back to the Enlightenment in Europe. You know, the Greeks, I'm Greek American, Greeks are fond of saying democracy started in Greece. It's a pretty primitive form. If you go to Iceland, they'll say, we had a democracy a thousand years ago, I guess, kind of. But democracy as we understand it today is about 250 years old. It's way too soon to tell, but I'm not going to bet against it. Yeah, I think that's um, that's fair. And uh, we're all right there with you. Um, I have to ask a process question because this fascinates me. You co-wrote this book with Elliot Ackerman. He is a former White House fellow and a former Marine. But you've written, as you've said, nine nonfiction books of your own, like Sailing True North and Sea Power, two of my favorites. Why take on a co-author for your debut in the fiction world? It's a good story, I think. So I'd written these nine nonfiction books, um, did very well. Um, Sailing True North, you mentioned a moment ago, hit number 10 on the Amazon national bestseller list, fiction, nonfiction combined. So very successful book. So I went to my uh, editor at Penguin Press and I said, okay, I've written nine books. Now I want to write a novel. 
and my editor said, Admiral, you are a great guy and we love your books, but you're not a novelist. <laughs> Let's talk about your next nonfiction book. And I was like, I was like a little eight year old kid. I said, yes, I can, I can write a novel. <laughs> and he said, he said, uh, you know, we went back and forth and, and he said, finally, all right, write up a detailed outline, give me a sample chapter, you know, and I hadn't done that since my second or third book. Um, but okay, I understand hazing. And so I did all that and I really put together a detailed idea for what is now uh, 2034. And I took it to him and he read it all and he called me up and he said, Admiral, you are a great guy, but you are still not a novelist. Wow. So he said, but I know a novelist and I think it's somebody you could work with very, very well. And he mentioned Elliot's name. Well, here's another funny small world comment. Um, I've known Elliot Ackerman for the better part of a decade. He's a fellow graduate of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Um, I, I have the greatest regard for him. And when I was dean at the Fletcher School, I made him our writer in residence after he published his first novel, Green on Blue. In fact, if you flip over Green on Blue, you'll see Admiral Stavridis' blurb on the back, which favorably compares Elliot Ackerman to Ernest Hemingway. Oh my I, believe, I believe that. So I said to my editor, well, I'd be thrilled. I think the real question is, would Elliot want to work with me? And um, Elliot was enthusiastic. We took the detailed outline. We sketched out the characters. And then uh, Elliot would do the first draft. I would heavily engage and edit and change. We would go back and forth, chapter one done. And then repeat six times. There's only six chapters in the book, as you know. And again, it's a very tight read. We, we, we thought at one point, and I will admit my first outline was much bigger. You know, you had NATO, you had Japan, you had Brazil involved. And we decided relentlessly to narrow the scope because we wanted to come down to just a handful of characters. We didn't want to write Red Storm Rising. We didn't want to write War and Remembrance and winds of war, 1,200 pages combined. This is not war and peace. You can read this in a day or so. And I, I challenge anybody to pick up the book, start reading it, and not stay with it, again, because of the characters in the book, who I think are very real and very compelling. Yeah, it's a quick, um, it is a quick read. It's 300 pages, but it is the kind of thing, you know, I remember way back in the day, um, picking up the firm, and I'm dating myself, but you know, when I was in college, and I think I skipped my classes for 24 hours because I couldn't put it down. Oh, I agree. I think there is a John Grisham-like quality to this. I have a, a signed first edition of the firm, by the way, which is worth a few bucks. Um, wow. I, I'm a big fan of John Grisham. He's a he's a he's an excellent pure writer, and it's because of characters. You remember the characters. I'll tell you two characters in. Uh, 2034 that for me are very compelling. And uh, one of them may surprise you or may not. Um, the, the one that may surprise you is my very favorite character in the book is the Chinese Admiral, Lin Bao. And uh, I, I don't wanna give away too much here, but he has some strong linkages to America, although he's utterly loyal to China. He's at a desk job in Washington. He's the, the attache in Washington at the start of the novel. And all he wants to do is get back to sea. Believe me, I've been there six tours in the Pentagon. I'd sit at my desk thinking, when will the Navy release me into the wild again? And Lin Bao also, his greatest dream is that at the end of his career, he wants to become a teacher. He wants to become a professor. And of course, that's what I did when I finished my career, became Dean at the Fletcher School. So I really like Lin Bao. And the other character is pretty obvious. I like the Commodore Sarah Hunt at the very beginning who carries some demons and uh, goes through a, a horrific scene in the first few pages. She loses three of her destroyers out of the seven in her squadron. Yet she's resilient and determined and comes back, yet you will see she carries the weight of what she's been asked to do for her country. There are a couple of really compelling characters in my Yeah, opinion. there are, absolutely. 
Hey, sir, um, how do you think this book is going to be received in, in China? Have you, have you heard any feedback? Well, from I, that? I was chatting with someone, with a really good question that I recommend you ask uh, people about books. And it's a clever question. And it's, if you could force one person to read your book, who would it be? And I said, well, that's easy. It would be President Xi. Yeah. Uh, mainly because if I could even get a picture of him holding the book, <laughs> millions of copies <laughs> in China. Um, you know, my last two books have been published in Mandarin, have, have sold well in China. Um, and as, as, as you know, Suzanne, in Sea Power, I take a pretty critical eye toward China about the South China Sea and the claims of territoriality, yet the book was published and sold reasonably well there. I think if the Chinese actually read the book, they will see that this is not, you know, good guys and bad guys. This is not the Tom Clancy kind of approach here. Um, there's only one villain in this book. The villain is war itself. Mm -hmm. And that's why, in all seriousness, I would want President Xi to read it. Because I would think, I would hope, he could find it as frightening and as compelling as I hope many Americans will. And certainly, given that Secretary Gates and Secretary uh, Mattis both found it to have a very compelling message in that regard, I would be hopeful that, um, that President Xi would as well. I'm going to send it to two of my uh, close friends, if I may say that, who are senior Chinese officials. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable uh, saying their names. Um, one is the Chinese ambassador to the United Kingdom. He's a Fletcher graduate, a contemporary of mine. Uh, we were at Fletcher together. Um, he's a lot taller and has great executive hair. He's like the Chinese <laughs> James Bond. Uh, <laughs> and the other one is a woman named Fu Ying, who is uh, the, effectively the deputy foreign minister of China. So I'm gonna get, and they're both utterly fluent in English. I'm going to get the book in some people's hands, and I hope that they will um, give it a serious look. We're pausing our conversation with author and Cypher Brief expert Admiral Jim Stavridis for just a moment to personally invite you to join myself and former Deputy Director of the NSA Rick Leggett as we co-host the Cypher Brief Cybersecurity Summit March 23rd through the 25th. Microsoft President Brad Smith will be there in conversation with former PDDNI Susan Gordon. FireEye CEO Kevin Mandia, who led the investigation that exposed the Solar Winds hack to the world, will be there in conversation with General David Petraeus. We'll hear from the acting director of CISA, Brandon Wales, and NSA's Dave Luber, as well as dozens of other cyber experts. Tickets are free. You can find the link to register in the Cypher Brief's free morning newsletter, or just Google the Cypher Brief and Cybersecurity Summit. Now back to our conversation with Cypher Brief expert and author, Admiral Jim Stavridis. You know, one thing we haven't talked about yet is the cyber connection um, in your book. There cannot be a great plot that is based in reality that doesn't somehow bring together the cyber with the very real sort of tactical on the ground threats that we see today. Um, what are your thoughts about how you deal with cyber in the book and what you're seeing play out in the headlines every day? Well, don't forget we wrote the book and finished it and turned it in about a year ago. Um, what has happened in the last 60 days in the world of cyber is nothing but validation for the warning bell we strike in the book. And uh, certainly the twin major hacks of solar winds, which you just mentioned, as well as the pretty evidently Chinese attack on Microsoft Exchange servers just in the last few weeks. Hackman hack, yes. Correct, um, is a very, very significant step by both of those major cyber powers. And of course, um, a micro example of the danger is what happened in my home state of Florida, where I'm affectionately known as Admiral Florida Man. Uh, <laughs> and down in South Florida, uh, a small water municipality was hacked, yeah. Oldsmar, Florida. And uh, using cyber, a hacker was able to attempt to add a highly toxic level of chemicals to the drinking water supply. Um, both small and huge examples are out there. So in 2034, cyber plays a very significant, I would argue a pivotal role as events 
initially unfold. And then it's kind of a bit of back and forth. The warning flag here is on current trajectory, China will surpass the United States in its mastery of offensive cyber, um, probably not in the next five years, but I would argue probably by the end of the decade, particularly as quantum computing enters the mix, and certainly by the 10 to 15 year future, which of course is where we've set the book, 2034. So we, you know, we've done a few things at the Cipher Brief in the past regarding uh, fiction writing and national security, and I personally think it's fantastic, and and we need a lot more of it. But if, when you look at issues like cyber or China, it's fair to say that most Americans still, the further you get away from DC, don't really have a concept of what's relevant or important. How do we crack this nut? Because I don't know, I don't know that it's going to be government driven. Are we, is it going to come down to more books like yours being written that are accessible and paint a picture that really causes us to, like you say, look outside our window and say, oh my gosh, is it is this what we need more of? Um, yes, it is. Although I fear that until there is a massive cyber attack that has direct consequences on the US public. Um, look at what happened when the electric grid went down in Texas. You finally got everybody's attention in a very serious way. Right. Um, I think, unfortunately, it's going to take probably not quite a cyber Pearl Harbor but uh, or a cyber Twin Towers, but I'd say a cyber Texas electric grid event where we can tag it to an, an international adversary, the North Koreans get in and take down uh, the grid of the Western part of New York state. I think it's gonna take an actual incident like that. Um, but as, uh, uh, as a writer, again, back to your original and excellent question, why write a novel? I've written about cyber endlessly for two decades trying to hit this alarm bell and haven't raised, in my view, a sufficient level of readiness yet. Uh, so I'm going to try a novel and, uh, and I'm going to be hopeful we can, in this painless way, imagine our way to what a war and a massive cyber attack could look like and what can we learn from it? How can we reverse engineer ourselves back to the present and avoid it? It, it reads like a Jack Bauer episode of 24 in a way. And I'm just thinking about my friend Howard Gordon sitting out in Los Angeles working on his next great big thing after putting Homeland to bed. I have to ask, like any movie deals, any any thoughts about TV series coming out of this? It, it does seem like, and both you and Brad have mentioned, like this is the way to get the focus on this story. What, what, can, we, what can we look forward to? I agree completely. Um, I'll share that I got a phone call from a major studio head who said he had just read it and he said, I, I, I only have one question. How should much? We, nope. Should, <laughs> we, should we do it as a movie or should we do it as a miniseries? Wow. And, uh, I said, you know, here's my agent's email. Um, conversations are ongoing. Stay tuned. Yeah, that's that's very exciting that's because I, I agree with both of you. I think the easiest way for people to understand the implication of these broader national security threats that we don't see every day, the implication that these have on their lives or could have on their lives is to put it in a format that's easy to follow and is character driven, as you mentioned, it was a big focus for you. So any, um, any closing thoughts for us? I know that you are back to back out there talking about this book and we're so grateful um, to have you not only as a Cypher Reef expert, but also to take the time to do the podcast with us today. Any closing thoughts for us? I think we hit it in the last couple of sentences, which is I would say to everybody, uh, think about cyber, think about what that supercomputer called an iPhone 12 reveals about you the doors it opens into your life and how vulnerable it is. And thus, cyber ought to be something we think about, talk about, and push our national officials to address. Uh, that's a big lesson from 2034 that is very specific, I think, for the cipher brief, because I'll return the compliment and just say what a superb job the cipher brief does 
covering not only its wheelhouse intelligence, but truly um, cyber and how it fits into the mix. So thank you for what you're doing to raise awareness on that crucial issue. And we buy the book and enjoy it. <laughs> we appreciate that very much. And, and thank you. Yes, you can um, definitely find out more on the website, uh, 2034, A Novel of the Next World War. Thank you so much, Admiral Jim Stavridis. Um, your new book, um, co-written with Elliot Ackerman, is on the Cypher Brief Bookshelf. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Suzanne. We'd like to thank everyone for listening. If you're interested in more national security expert conversations like this one, be sure to sign up for the Cypher Brief's free daily newsletter at thecypherbrief.com and be sure to like us and leave comments. We appreciate you being a part of the Cypher Brief community. Take care.